is Mike Palmetto. I want to thank you to, for coming to the webinar today. Um, quick word about myself. I work at the American University Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. I'm Assistant Director for Interdisciplinary Research. Um, thanks again for joining the webinar. Please be aware that this is being recorded. The link will be pub made publicly available a few days after today. We are going to have a brief, maybe 20, 30 minute presentation uh, followed by Q&A. Uh, ask people to use the hand raising function during Q&A, uh, the little icon on Zoom. Our speaker today is uh, Amina Millard. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, and, that's right. Uh, Hi, yeah. <laughs> she is the patent information manager at the Medicines Patent Pool. She manages the patents and licenses database, the MedsPal database, and performs patent searches and analyses. Uh, she is registered as a Swiss and European patent attorney and has broad experience as a patent specialist in the private sector, particularly in the field of biopharmaceuticals. Uh, today's webinar is intended to show everyone in detail a source of patent and licensing data that could be very useful for folks who want to do empirical research on IP and medicine prices or medicine access. Uh, for instance, the MedSpell database has been used in a paper demonstrating that patent and licensing status influence the prices of the two WHO recommended HPV medi uh, medications. Other researchers have used the data from MedSpal on patent expiry to estimate the future cost of treatments for HIV, HPV, and TB. Uh, finally, this webinar is the third in a series of occasional webinars on the empirics of access to medicines and trade policy. It grew out of a workshop chaired by Professor Deborah Gleason at the Fifth Global Congress on IP and the Public Interest. Our webinars are online on a page on the Info Justice blog. I will put the link in the chat for people who are interested. This is also the page where the link to this will be made available. Um, our, my one final note, in November, our next webinar will take place. It'll be a presentation of the TRIPS Plus PTA data set by jean Frederick Moran. It's a data set that maps 90 types of TRIPS plus intellectual property provisions in 126 agreements signed between 1991 and 2016. So with that, I will turn this over to Amina Millard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, here, I'm gonna start. So thanks very much for the uh, invitation to present MedSpad. Um, I'm really glad to do that. Um, okay, I'm just making sure, okay, I have my slide. I hope everyone can see the slide. Um, so I might, I'll be touching many, many subjects. So yes, please, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to uh, ask them at the end, or you know, if I'm going too fast, please let me know. So today we're going to talk about MedPA. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce the database uh, to you. So what are we talking about? So MedSpal is the um, most comprehensive open access source of information on patent and licensing status of patented essential medicines in low and middle income countries. So just to, to give you a framework. So we're talking about database that has uh, more than 8,000 uh, patent or patent application, national patent or patent application that covers about 110 medicines. Uh, with information, we're about uh, 50 on uh, about 50 licenses, and I will go into details on those as well, as well as data exclusivity. So that's regulatory data exclusivity information for uh, a set of countries. We're gonna go through an introduction to the medicines patent pool, and then a little bit of the background on medical. Because um, we then we move on to the content and how we collect data and then a demonstration. So the demonstration will be a couple of slides and then if everything is working fine, maybe we could have it online. We can see, you know, depending also on the Q&A and the time. So the medicines patent pool, I don't know if many people know the medicine patent pool. The medicines patent pool was funded by UNITAID in 2010. So it is the first voluntary uh, licensing patent pooling mechanism in public health. 
It was created to increase access to new HIV treatment in lower middle income countries and also to facilitate innovation uh, such as the creation of new fixed dose combination and pediatric formulation thanks to the pooling of patents from different patent holders. In 2015, uh, the MPP expanded it ma its mandate to hepatitis C as well as tuberculosis. Again, in 2018, the mandate was, was expanded to essential medicines, all essential medicines in any therapeutic area. And finally, in 2020, uh, we have the, the MPP temporarily expanded the mandates to also include uh, any health technology medicines that could contribute to the global response to COVID-19. Uh, what's the MPP? So the, the MPP, how does it work? So MPP negotiates with public health, um, uh, with the originator, driven licenses, with, uh, the licenses uh, on cer certain medicines, and then MPP sub-licenses these uh, medicines to a number of generics. Uh, MPP license, so the license terms uh, of MPP, the licenses are really um, very transparent and um, uh, and really the aim is allowing uh, the uh, access to um, medicines in lower and middle income countries at an affordable price. Um, so just a few numbers on you know the licenses that MPP has signed licenses in HIV. Uh, one on the technology platform. We have three licenses on hepatitis uh, uh, C medicines and one, uh, one on TB. I'm not going into the details of the figures to the right, so just to give you the it really, really is an impact, uh, especially in really allowing low middle income countries to access the, uh, to have access to, uh, late, to the latest medicine really at a good price. Uh, MPP uh, is funded for the uh, HIV, TB, and hepatitis B. All the activities are funded by UNICEF. And the expansions of MPP to essential medicines uh, is funded uh, by the uh, Swiss Agency for Development. Now, on MedSpa. So to understand, you know, the origin of MedSpa, so this is, again, the way the MPP uh, model works. So the yeah, first... The bus is the loca. So the first step into the, um, uh, into, into the model is prioritizing the medicines for which the MPP would then go to the patent holder try when negotiating agreements. Uh, the next step is the, negoci the negotiation itself, followed by the, uh, once the licenses are signed, the sub-licenses to generic companies, which then develop and then also develop new formulation or better adapted formulation to low middle income countries. Now, the, the first step really in the priorit uh, prioritizing medicines is uh, finding out the patent status of these medicines in the low middle income countries in order to understand whether they should be prioritized or not. So one, one, well, when MPP was um, back in 2010, MPP needed to collect really wealth of information on these medicines in a low middle income country. And that was really tricky tricky because when we're talking about medicines and patents, also, although patent information should be, is public, is made public, having access to that information, especially in low middle income countries where patent offices do not have patent registers or maybe there's a barrier language, there's also the ability to identify which patents are important and that's due to the fact that when patents are filed on, on um, uh, on medicines, the uh, the drug, let's say the, the name used in the patents themselves are usually either uh, research codes or just the chemical formula. And then the uh, international non proprietary name that is then given Hi, to Goli, Goli. medicines afterwards is only really um, comes into the picture a few years after the patents have been filed. So it's not easy to to understand that especially if you're not a chemist or you're not a biologist so mpp gathered that information with the help of wipo patent attorneys national passion groups and then there was really a, 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 a the stakeholders asked mpp to make that information available and this was done back in 2011 for hiv medicine as a, a sheet an excel worksheet uh, on the website and then in 2000 
the next part was uh, was really now just to give you an idea uh, and I think Mike you know, already explained a little bit at in introduction. So MedSpad is, we, we made the survey uh, to, in 2019. And so this is to show you what uh, the information MedSpad is used for. So mainly for advocacy uh, as part of freedom to operate opinion, sometimes also for policy analysis and, uh, also, uh, and also a lot by procurement agency. Um, just also to give you an idea, so these are some quotes about uh, from the Global Fund, the IDF Foundation, Médecins Sans Frontières, just explaining that the, the, some of the major play, players in you know access to medicines and and uh, procurement use the database. So how do we? So what are we talking about? So what is the information that you can find in Medpal and how do we collect? So to start with. What are these medicines that we're talking about? When we say 110 priority medicines and about 200 formulations, so just to explain the formulations, you have one medicine that can be given either as a tablet or as an oral formulation. If you go to MedPath, we find both the oral and the tablet, but this is what we count as different formulations, as the patent, especially covering the formulation, may be different. Um, so, again, uh, the, the, at the start, we have uh, all patented medicines uh, for the treatment of HIV, hepatitis C, as well as TB that are included in the WHO treatment guideline. And then following the expansion uh, in 2017, the essential medicine list, any patented uh, medicine on the WHO uh, EML list. What we also do, uh, we follow, on the, um, we follow uh, the pipeline for uh, uh, the drug in TB, in HIV, and products that reach phase two, phase three, and are you know, showing to be really promising, then we also include those in MEDSPA, as that usually is also quite important because we, even if it's prior to marketing uh, to, to approval, that's the information that could be uh, important to, to have. And again, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, patented COVID-19 uh, candidate. So, so far, for example, we've added about 10 drugs, including some biological, some antibodies. Now the patent, uh, patent and patent application. Um, how do we gather this, this, where does it come from? So once we've identified the, the, the medicine that we want to, uh, during the prioritization process or you know, we identified that it is um, a, a drug medicine that we want to add to MEDSPA. We want to find the basic or the relevant patents that cover that drug or that formulation, the use. So I, I really don't know, you know, how much everyone knows about patents, but there are several types of patents. So that if usually the first one, uh, if you have a new molecule, then you will find a patent on that new molecule. Further along, you will have patents on processes to make that molecule, and then formulation, and then patents on the use of that molecule. Uh, now, if uh, medicine has already been approved, and in, especially in the US or Canada, so that's a very useful source of information uh, because the marketing authorization uh, holder uh, have an obligation to provide a list of patents that are related to that new drug that will be marketed. And that's a, a very important source of information as it's really the uh, or originator instead of providing that information. So that saves sometimes into searching patent databases for the, the same information. So we use the US FDA Orange Book as a, a source of information, uh, Health Canada Patent Register, as well as publicly available licenses such as MPPs and also uh, landscape that are uh, prepared by WHO or UNITAID. So, you know, many of those were prepared for uh, anti-retrovirals. So once we identify this uh, basic patent, so that's a patent that is uh, granted in either Canada or US, what we really want to do now is really understand in which other countries that patent was also filed, because patents are national, so it's a national right. A patent holder has to file um, for a 
patent in each country where uh, he wants to get a patent. And then each country has a set of rules for examination and things like that. But then um, all patents in different countries that one application, we group them together under what we call a patent family. The patent family can have many different uh, meanings or definitions, but then let's say that we want to do is gather that patent information. So most of it for high income countries will be available, usually on public uh, patent databases, such as the European Patent Office uh, database, uh, SPASNET, or on the uh, on WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization database that is called Patent Scope. But what we really want to do is find those patents that are not in those databases, and usually these are in the low and middle income countries. So this is, I'm, I'm going to give you an example on how we do that. And finally, once we collected that data, we put it in MedSpas, then uh, we give a description to the patent family, uh, we check the patent expiry date, and then we keep, we try to keep the status as uh, updated as possible because as you may know or not, patents really have a life. Usually from the moment the patent application is filed, there are 20 years from that moment. And within these 20 years, once it's filed, then it goes through a whole process, first administrative and then substantive, and then it can be granted, or it could be rejected, or it could be abandoned by the patentee. So that's the legal status. So what's the status? And then if it's granted, then it will um, expire after usually 20 years if um, it is maintained. So if renewal fees are paid to maintain, to maintain that patent life. So, and then a patent also could be opposed. That uh, could be opposed by any party that thinks that patent should not be granted. Uh, so that is the legal status that we have to keep track of. And that's the most difficult part for, for some countries really. So just to give you um, an example, oh yeah. So with MedSpa, some of that is automated, such as the uh, querying the US Orange Book, Health Canada, getting the Impadoc patent families. So these are the uh, fam patent families from Fastnet, but then all of the rest is usually manual. So just to give you an example, uh, so on Dolutegravir, which is the, uh, the first line recommended uh, drug for the treatment of HIV by WHO. So if you search Health Canada for the uh, dolutegravir, then as you can see in that table to the right, you will find a patent number. So that's the Canadian patent that has been listed that covers this uh, product. Then if we go on the uh, US FDA Orange Book, and then we also look for dolutegravir, then we also have a list of patents uh, with their expiry dates in the US which can be a little bit different from other countries. Um, then what we do, we, we take those, oh, sorry, I think there's something. Okay, we also have basic uh, patent information in MPP uh, licenses or other licenses if the annexes are made available to the public, which help us also identify the families and their uh, members. So once we have that, you know, Canadian or US application, then we will go on ESPASnet, so there is the European Patent Office. And as you can see down below in that big rectangle, uh, these are the equivalents. So these are the patent application published in other countries. So starting from the Can Canadian one, then here we have uh, the two first two letter codes are the letter codes for the, the country, the ISO code for the country. So many European patent, Hong Kong, Japanese, Mexican, Polish, um, you know, a long list and the Vietnamese over there. We will also do the same thing we go to patent scope. So the, the aim really there is try to identify those patents that, you know, the, for instance, here you have the UA, the, those that are underlined in red in that big rectangle are the Ukrainian and the Indonesian uh, patents or patent application that were not in the SPASnet database, but then we will retrieve through uh, patent scope in one part of patent scope, because then um, patent scope is, um, so white will administer the international patent application. So once a patent application, an international patent application is filed, uh, 30 or 31 months from the, the filing date, 
the patent holder has to go and decide in which countries he wants to go ahead with the patent application. So for instance, here we see other uh, patents that we did not have in either the net or the other the publication of patent scopes. So here we have Philippines, Colombia, a Russian uh, patent. So um, one very important source of information that we also have is that in India, the patent applicant has to uh, provide the list of equivalent patents when if they want to go ahead with the patent application. So that's also a very good source of information. It's in the form of a PDF. So we have to go uh, search by the Indian application number that we found on patent scope, and then go to the Indian Patent Office register, go to the document, the, the file wrapper, the file history, and then from there, look for this specific form where we know we will find the remaining, let's say, uh, patent family members. So here we have Algeria and Egypt that did not show up before because these patent offices don't send their information automatically to either uh, Espacenet or EDO. So just to, to show you a little bit, you know, how we collect that information. Another source of information that's also um, uh, important is patent form that was, I think it's now two years old. And patent form has also patent information on, uh, on, uh, on uh, medicines. And it's um, the patent holders and the originator. I think there are uh, 20 pharmaceutical companies that have agreed to provide information on granted patents for their approved product, if they are on the EMA, if I remember well. So this is also a very good source of information uh, for granted patents and not for patent application, but it's uh, very useful as well. And finally, uh, checking the status uh, of national patents, we usually go to each patent office if that information is not available again through uh, the EPO or whatever. And then we go and search number by number and try to see what status the uh, status. And then we, if there's any change, we then update MedFund. Uh, again, so this is the same thing with a, a Vietnamese patent. Uh, thanks for the translation. Uh, then, you know, you kind of have to read through there and see which is the latest legal state. Uh, finally, one other thing that we, um, source of information that we have, uh, MPP has signed a memorandum of understanding with patent offices that have agreed to exchange information on uh, the status of patent application. And this is really uh, helpful because some of these have a very good patent office, uh, patent register, but then we still have specific uh, questions sometimes about claims. Because once the patent is granted, not enough to know that a patent has been granted, but then the claims, so what is the breadth of the, what is being covered by a patent is important. And the only access to, to those claims to really go to the patent office and asking for copy. Um, voila, so that's to, again, so this is how we collect the patent, uh, the patent data for each product that we put in Metapath. Uh, now, about the licenses, so when we say that um, uh, we put license information in MedSpal, so what do we mean by that? So we will have the uh, licenses that uh, were negotiated by the MPP. And when we put these in MedSpal, we also have a link to the full information, to the text of the licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Bilateral licenses between uh, originators and generic companies. So when this information is made available, is publicly available, we take it and then we digest it and then we in MedSpal with also the countries, if we have the countries that are included in the licenses. So we try, to, we really put in one place that information. And also if we're aware of commitments not to force patents on a given product in a country, then we also include that in MedSpal. And finally, we also put information on compulsory licenses okay. if there are any. So this is for the licenses. And finally, data exclusivity. So again, data exclusivity is linked to the regulatory approval. And some countries have adopted this regulation whereby if there's a data exclusivity period in place, the if there's a generic that would like to file 
for a generic version of an approved drug, then he, they cannot rely on the originator data, clinical and preclinical data to do so. so. They have to wait for five years or whatever, depending on the country and on the regulation. So even if you have no patent in a country, if there's data exclusivity in place, then generics cannot enter. So we try also to capture that in MEXPA. So we have that for 15 countries. And I must say that's the trickiest part to update because then we have to reach out to regular authorities to see if we have uh, also registered and, 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 and get that information. So all of that is taken together and put in MEXPA. Um, I'm gonna show you very quickly what it looks like and then we see whether we need to go online or not. But let's say, I think that the, the database itself is quite easy uh, for user-friendly. It's really important to understand what's in it. So, uh, and searching is fairly easy as well. So if you arrive to the landing page of MedPal, you could either do a search view or a map view. So when you do a search view, in the keyword, the first box, the keyword search, you can search by keywords. And this goes and searches into all the fields that are available in there. It could be patent number, if you have it, it could be a brand name, a uh, specific country, etc. Uh, you can search by specific product. So uh, it could be Abacavir, Dolutecavir, Remdesivir. Uh, you just uh, put that in there. You can uh, search on multiple products at the same time, and then countries. Again, low and middle income country, it really is the, uh, the, our mandate. And if you find a high income country such as Chile, the reason behind it is that Chile at one point has been included in one of the licenses, maybe of one of the old products when it was still a low middle, in, uh, uh, low middle income country, uh, upper middle country. So, this is the, really the only exception for high income countries in the database. So we keep the information that we have and we also update it for the other products. And finally, you can also search by disease area. And these are the disease areas that are uh, appro uh, for approved indication or WHO recommended off label indication if we're aware, uh, aware of those, uh, as well as indication under investigation for the products which are still uh, being tested. Let's say here we have an example again with the Dolutegravir where we take DTG in Ukraine. So as you see here, the, the results that you get is a table with uh, the product name. If the product uh, is in the um, WHO EML, it will be flagged with the, the little EML flag in there. Disease area and then the patent description. So the patent description tries to really summarize the uh, the scope of the whole patent family. Uh, here we only have one country, but let's, if we have another country, we have. We try also to, in really one sentence, explain what the whole patent is about. But that's not always easy. Uh, in this instance, this is the compound patent, so that's the patent covering dolutegravir. But as you can say, it also covers another uh, product that's called approved earlier this year in Canada, also for HIV. Uh, and this is because the uh, the patent is quite broad and it covers analog, probably a market formula. So it really covers DTG, but then other products. And most importantly, then you have the patent status. So here, uh, for this is a granted uh, Ukrainian patent and the patent status term extended. So patents uh, covering pharmaceutical products could be extended by a maximum of five years in Europe. Uh, also, the U now the US have another uh, room for calculation, but then you, these are the patents that go beyond the 20 year expiry that I was talking earlier about. So this is quite an important information. And when we find it, we put it there. We put the system with the expiry date uh, that correspond to that. And finally, you also have the, the when the record was last updated or when we updated last the record. So that's quite important information also to have. So after the patent application information, you have that little um, the second box relates to data exclusivity. So as you can see in Ukraine, 
there was a data exclusivity that had uh, that has expired in 2019, but it's important to keep that information in there because it's better to know when or if that exclusivity had has expired. Uh, finally, license information. So here we have a list of all licenses that include uh, this specific country. Uh, for uh, yes, um, if you click on uh, the hyperlinked uh, patent number, patent publication number, so this takes you to SSNet if that record exists on SSNet, and uh, from there, so you have more information on the patent itself, also. Um, source of the status, for instance, here you could see that the patent status source was from applicants, but that could be uh, from one of these Indian Form 3 that I talked to you before. Um, or, no, no or. And then if you click on the uh, the publication number again, so this will, oops, sorry, I didn't put the uh, screenshot there, but this will take you to the uh, SFNet, and then you can have access to the patent document itself with access to the claims, and all the uh, other bibliographical data, inventor, uh, and so on. Again, clicking, if you go back to the, our results, clicking on the, uh, the, the, the list of licenses, and if you choose a license, then you have a license card that opens, and in this one, you will have a link if uh, it's an MPP license to the information on the MPP license that we have on MPP's website with the access to the, the agreement itself. And if it's uh, a source that we found online, then we will put, put the source from a generic company, from the originator announcing um, bilaterals and things like that. So we always have for there. And important, most importantly is the countries. So in there, uh, here you can only see the first, first few countries included in the license, you can really have the list of all countries included in the license, as well as the licensee, so MPP licensee, current MPP licensee. Um, so this is the map view. Uh, so this is the other uh, way of searching for information whereby you can just select a product in there and then you decide what it is that you want to see on the map. So you can highlight uh, the countries where there is at least a patent either granted or five, so patent application or a patent. You could uh, also select uh, countries where there is at least one compound patent, because usually these are the most blocking one for generic, as they cannot really uh, design around. I mean, the patent on the compound, let's say, is the one that has the more weight. Uh, also, uh, and you can also uh, decide to see which um, the countries and then the, the license status, whether they are included in licenses. And again, if you select a specific country uh, to the right, you will have the list of licenses. And then if you have selected to see patents, then you will have also the link to the uh, patent number and then again to MedPat for, for more information. Uh, so this is very important, so it's the disclaimer part. So we do what we can to keep the data as updated as possible, but um, MedSpal is not meant to provide freedom to operate analysis. Uh, it really is a snapshot of what's happening in the country for specific products at a particular point in time. And any, you know, you should always, always contact uh, the, either the relevant national regional patent office, consult the local patent council to really obtain, you know, up-to-date information and uh, just don't rely only on MEDSA. And uh, that's it for me. So I don't know if, oof, I think I, I went a little bit over. Okay, th that is it. Uh, uh, th that is fine to go a little over. Um, thanks. That was very interesting. You know, I've used the MidsPal database before, but I had no idea there was so much other stuff on it. Um, so for Q and A, let me open up the participant thing so I can see it better. Um, yeah, I'm trying also to open uh, the Zoom. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You can Stop sharing screen. I can stop sharing if I found one. Stop share. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, I do want to leave with um, 
just a, a question of my own. I hadn't realized there was data exclusivity information in the in the uh, database. And um, I was asking, have you, in the among the 15 countries you have, have you found a lot of instances of data exclusivity outlasting patent protection or being used instead of patent protection in countries where patents aren't filed for? Because I've always, you know, I've heard a lot about it, but I haven't, I'm not sure about particular examples of it. There might be. The, I've updated that exclusivity for, I think, what was it, Ukraine? I did it for a few countries, and I think that I, I don't have an example in mind, but I think that we do have examples about where it lasts a little bit more than the patent protection. I should, you know, go and search a little bit of the database to find those, but yes. Especially okay. if the approval really, uh, the, the drug gets approved, you know, really uh, next near to the uh, expiry date of the product. Okay. And um, with that, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. If people could uh, raise their hands using the, the little hand raise button, um, or else you could do it on the screen. But I'm I'm looking for hands on the side where you use the the little icon to raise your hand. Do we have other questions? Where is hand? Hello. Um, could I ask a question? Yes. Um, my name is Alex Belinsky, and I'm patent information professional, uh, having experience searching for such information in low-income countries. And I would say it's a terrific work. And, um, uh, and then I had questions, at least one. Uh, you use low-income countries and not use law uh, least developed countries. And under the TRIPS agreement, in many countries, this patent is not enforceable. For example, Bangladesh. And you list patents in many of such countries, which is least dependent countries. And the broad question is, is this patent enforceable at all? Hmm. I would say probably not. In the, well, uh, uh, I'm not really familiar with the TRIPS and the LDCs. But um, uh, I, I really don't know. Um, I think that, uh, uh, was it in the, I think in the LDCs, no, I think I will have to research that, but I'm not really good at that. I know that we list that information because we find it. Uh, now I will have to research a little bit into whether they are enforceable or not. But yeah, well, it would be. It's a good Another question. mark in your in your database is an impossibility in this country. And the mm. second question is, um, you do not provide, uh, likely not intentionally, information about the basic patents. So uh, when you go to National Register, you can see, uh, you can find the, the name of uh, um, one of the patent and find the title like a medicine. So it's not descriptive. And you may find several patents from this uh, company, but it's hard to find out to which patent in Orange Book it corresponds. Yes, because you, I see the, the, the issue is, yes, because we do not show the, um, the high income countries. Um, yeah, we would have to go either go on the, yes, you'd have to go through uh, the one of the Espasnet or to really make the connection between the, the patent listed in the Orange Book or the FDA and the one that we have in Metspa. Yes, we don't, maybe we could show that information. We could, because we have it, because this is what we call the flagged patent, because this is how we put it in there. But this could be something that we could be showing. Because today Thank we you. don't have any way of showing the whole in the whole patent family. Well, you can regroup the patent family by the description in Metspa, but we already had the request to being able to see the whole patent family. But because we're not showing the high income, it's a little bit complex. But then maybe we could flag it somewhere. Hmm. I think did that answer your question? 
um, yes, if you would be able to provide the priority information, at least when you know, it would help to see what the claim is. Oh, the priority information is there? No, it's not. Oh, yeah. oh I'm oh, sorry. sorry. No, no, it's I'm fine. Sorry, I didn't find it. I didn't yes, find I, it. I can, I can very quickly show you because I did not put everything in the claims, but I'm going to share with you the, if it's fine with everyone else very quickly. I'm going to share with you uh, something that... Can you At see least it's not, it's not in downloadable file. You can oh, download yes, the database. Yes, it is. I'm going to show you. So can you see the MetSpout on your screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So here, what you can do in the add and remove column, because otherwise, you know, you really would have too much information in there. You can select more columns. And one of these has the priority numbers. Okay. As well as the PCT related application. And as we use simple family concept, you can also have the other PCT related application for the a wider. So once you have all of that, let's say uh, you take a product and then you have that information, you can simply export that into Thank a CSV. You. It's my overlook. It's fine, <laughs> no worries. Okay, we have a, a question that was posted to the chat from Barbara Milani. Uh, she asks, how do you source the relevant patents for biological medicines as they are not listed in the US FDA? Uh, I think the, the Health Canada helps us a lot because Health Canada do uh, list those. So if you go to the, uh, I can also put the link there. Uh, if you take any biologic on Health Canada, they have the basic patent and even more their formulation. So that is really useful. I can, this is, yep, this is the, I'm gonna just put the link to the Canadian patent register that works exactly like US FDA, but then has also the biology. And then when we, so if we don't have, uh, if a product is not approved, we usually search for it. And then, you know, I do searches by sequences and I try to find the patents covering the, the compounds. If, if I can do that. Any other questions? So, oh, who is? I, I have a question, another question actually real quick. Uh, how long does it take you to do all the steps to list one of these drugs? Because it seems like a very expensive search. And, a, and one of the, the most recent um, addition is all the COVID-19 medicines, which I'm sure is something people are very, very interested in. But everything's moving so quickly. How, how, how do you do all those steps to get COVID-19 information on it in, in real time or close to it? Yes, it, it takes, a, it's a really good question. It, depending on the product, how old it is, how well thick are the layers of patent protection around it, it can take me up to two or three days for one product, just to make sure that I have the right patent families, that I have managed to identify uh, all the, the patent family members. Just one thing also that's important maybe for user or for the people attending to know is that what we do also in Netspad is that we use a not files. So when we are sure that we have gathered information on all the countries, we can, it's more than assuming, we can really confirm, let's say that a basic patent was not filed in a certain country. And that is information that I think only Netspad provides. So when we really have not filed in there, uh, you, you know, it's, um, but you know, getting to that point of making sure that we have all the patent family, yes, it can take at least up to three to three to three days for one patent uh, for one product. And then for COVID, we you know we're trying to uh, we're following the tracking what's going on, and we we have a cutoff, so it depends on how many um, clinical trials the, pro the the product is, how they're doing, whether WHO is also interested. So this is how we try to keep up. 
so that we provide information on only interested drugs. And we also flagged at COVID those that are repurposed that we already had in Medpa, such as Lopinavir, Ritonavir, and uh, uh, some others. So that was easier. We just flagged those for COVID. But uh, yes, it's, it, it, it is time consuming. So, uh, but you know, if it's there and it's being used and can really help people understand the bad situation, so, worth it. Okay. We, ha we have another question in the chat um, to ask about the possibility for the database to link to patent oppositions and uh, use of other TRIPS flexibilities. Um, it's, so, I, yes, it's in the pipeline. So we are um, continuously developing MEDPA. So, you know, that field that you saw of disease areas was added very recently also to make sure that we can uh, separate COVID with, from the other medicines. And linking to the patent opposition database is something that we are uh, looking into. And in fact, uh, when I update the status of many patents, uh, oh yeah, that's also something that, oh, I haven't shown any, any example, but then if patent is opposed, then you will see the status either filed opposed, if um, opposition pre-grant are, uh, uh, such as in India, are filed, so we put the status there. And often the, the source comes from the opposition database, which you will find so if you open the card in the little source field, but we're trying, we will try to do that in the future sure okay we have a uh, hand raised Lewis hey um, thank you this has been very useful um, I have a question related to the collaborative agreement that the medicine patent pool has with uh, with the national offices you, you may have mentioned this but can you comment a little bit more on how this agreements are working are the offices um, sharing information with the medicine patent pool and what kind of information. Um, I, I think like the Dominican Republic patent office signed an agreement, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina. So Absolutely. it will be interesting yeah. to know how, how those are working. And then during your presentation, you mentioned that one of the sources that you use to, to find uh, the patent landscape, the le relevant patents was publicly available licenses. Uh, do you use, what, what sources do you use to find publicly available licenses? Uh, is, is this licenses not related to the medicine patent pool or are, or are you referring to patent, medicine patent pool licenses? Yes. yes. So when, uh, I, 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 I will answer the second one. Yes, when we refer to publicly available, I think the only publicly available uh, licenses to date are the MPP ones. And this is uh, quite a source of information for patents related to, uh, uh, you know, that are included in the annexes. I, I'm not aware of any other. Uh, yes, uh, maybe the other bilaterals that also have the same, um, usually the same coverage. Um, and regarding the MOUs, so um, what we do, so it, for example, the one of the most recent one was the one we signed with Egypt. And that was really uh, a, a very, uh, 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 we sent to them a list of all the Egyptian, maybe not all because in the MOUs, we try not to overload the patent office because it's still a manual thing. You know, we list, we sent to them a list and then they have to go through the list and, you know, provide us with the latest update of the status. Uh, but then, you know, when that information is not available from the patent office or, you know, they don't have the registers or, uh, for instance, in Egypt, you could find the granted patent on their registers, which is in Arabic, but, uh, uh, but not the, the status of pending applications. So if they're abandoned, you never know uh, the, the, the status of those patents that have been pending for ages. So when we have a contact with the patent office, we can really get the confirmation that you know those have been abandoned or whatever are still maybe in the um, in the examination process. So this is how it works. So it's still you know very manual, and we're also thinking on how we could maybe automate that a little bit in the future. And the same with the Dominican Republic. You know we send lists, and then you know the the patent office goes through the list and then send the information back to us. And other again, this is I mentioned at at the beginning. We also have, for instance, 
with the South African Patent Office. We really asked for the copies of granted claims in some instances where procurement agencies needed that information because you know, you know that a patent has been granted, but you don't know the scope. So some patent offices we ask now maybe for that kind of information. So could you send, you know, give us a copy of the granted claims? And we're trying to sign more of those, especially with the you know, patent offices that do not have registers and information available online. Um, Louis, do you have a follow up? Or because I have, a, I, your hand is still up. Oh, lower hand. Um, Alexander? Um, uh, yes, I have a question or suggestion. Um, uh, it would be nice if you would add information at least shortly about the stores. Um, it appeared to me that some countries which is listed uh, have no public source at all. And uh, they may be available likely from internal database of pharma and they provided it through licenses or somewhere. But if somebody tried to go to this country, they would not find nothing. And uh, if you will provide information which data came internally, then it makes easy other people not to spend time to various countries. Mm. So, you know, when I, sh I don't know, I, sh I showed you earlier, the, um, on MedSpal, you know, we, try, we always try to put the source, especially of the latest status. And when we put applicant, it's usually either um, it's from this uh, Indian Form 3 because it is, you know, it's, uh, it's the applicant that provides that information. But we could be more precise if that can help. But it, it would be a little bit of work for us. So when we put, yes, and if it's the patent office, we just put patent office. Um, so we have to dig a little bit into that to make it maybe a little bit clear. But then if you have specific maybe questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. You know, there's the, the general uh, medical email address. So maybe if you've seen that in specific cases and things like that, please drop us a, an email and then we can see how we could improve that. Thank you. Okay, there's a question in the chat from Ken Shadlin. He asks, will MPP provide the patent landscape on COVID vaccines? Excuse me, could you repeat? Because I was looking for the question, so I didn't hear it. Sorry? Sorry, I have to scroll up a little. Uh, the question is whether the MPP will provide the patent landscape on COVID vaccines. The landscape? Oh, on the vaccines. Hmm. Um, not something that we are, we kind of gathering information here and there, but uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. So uh, I, the new, the thing is that with the new, new vaccines, um, there might be patterns that are being filed now only, you know, since COVID uh, started and specific vaccines are being developed. So we are monitoring that. I don't know whether, you know, we're not really working on a, a full landscape today. But um, I'm writing down landscape for COVID-19 vaccine. At least we're not planning on, on any now. Especially that MedSpa is also not designed, or at least not for MedSpa, but uh, again. Okay, um, the next one in the chat might be more of a medicines patent pool question. Um, it, it's a question from Sushil Satpook. I hope I said that right. Uh, the question is when you negotiate with the patent holders, how do you further make it available to lower income countries? And what happens when the patent holders insist on different terms and conditions from country to country? I'm not the specialist for everything that has to do with proper negotiation, negotiations that happen with patent holder, but the way to make it available to the lower income countries, usually the, uh, the agreements really are only for those countries, is when the sub license uh, are signed, there 
the uh, we we many sub licensees when they are chosen and because there are many generic companies working or you know producing the product that brings the the, the, the price in fact of the um, uh, the prices down so that's and then the generic com usually the generic then start also their registration process in the uh, low income countries you know of the generic version so this is how you know it works it still maybe takes sometimes because registration takes sometimes but it's still shorter than you know if the the agreement were not in place so it's really speeding as well the access so make it a little bit wider but then also speeding the the, the process so this is and the patent insist oh so th that's not yeah i can't really answer the one about you know the patent holder i think that there are sometimes um depending whether you know it's an upper or lower middle income countries sometimes there can be royalty i think we have some uh, agreements where there are some royalties in place for some countries, but that's really is a negotiation. Uh, uh, I can't really answer that. Okay, um, so we're almost to the end of the hour. Um, are there other questions before we we uh, we close it? I don't think so. So. Thank you again for this excellent presentation. Um, it's just a staggering amount of information in MedSpal. I knew there was a lot, but apparently there's more than I knew about. And it was very interesting. Um, and everyone, I, well, I'll put the, I posted earlier in the chat, but I'll post it again in case people are interested. This is the link to the page where we have our previous webinars, note about our upcoming one. And once I get the link from Zoom and the caption of the captioner, this will all go up there. Um, thanks everyone for coming and thank you, Amina, for the talk. And thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. All right. Gavel, gavel. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.